Okay, the answer for part A. <coughs> now, let's just remember Gauss law. Gauss law tells us that if you take any surface, no matter how complicated the shape can be, the integral of the electric field over that surface is always the enclosed charge, that is the charge within that surface, inside the surface, divided by epsilon zero. This is independent of how complicated the shape is or whether the charges inside are inside metals, inside other materials or whatsoever. Whatever the charges are, the integral is always the enclosed charge divided by epsilon zero. Now let's look at the surface S1. Which charges are inside S1? This is inside S1 <coughs> plus 2Q. This is inside S1 plus Q. The conductor is neutral. There is no charge Q given there. So this is 3Q. This minus 3Q is also inside my surface. So the total charge inside this surface is 0. So for part A, the answer is a dot ds is equal to 0. This doesn't mean that the electric field is 0. Electric field is not 0. But at certain regions of the surface, this just tells me that at certain regions of the surface, the electric field, is field lines are going out of the surface. And in some other regions of the surface, the electric field lines are going into the surface. So if an electric field line goes out of the surface that contributes plus 1 to this integral, and a another electric field line goes into the surface that contributes a minus 1, this just tells me that the sum, they just cancel each other in the sum. <coughs> now let's look at B. E dot ds is again, it is just the total charge inside my surface divided by epsilon 0. The total charge inside this surface is minus Q minus 3Q. So the total charge is minus 4Q divided by epsilon 0. <coughs> These are the R integrals. Any questions on the quiz? OK, so okay, one news, there is no pre-report for this weekend, because next week, I, I just want to go over what we have done until now, just a review of the materials we have. We will have some concept questions, some questions that will test your understanding of, of the basic concepts, and we will discuss those questions. So that you don't have any pre-reports. Today, we will begin the potential and potential energy. electric potential and electric potential energy. <coughs> and probably we will just finish it <coughs> today or on Monday at most. And then we will just make a review next week. Now, any questions on the things that we had done until now? We are basically playing with the electric field. We are finding out some relations that the electric field satisfies, like the Gauss law. Gauss law is always valid, as you have seen in this quiz. But I mean, its practical use is quite limited to cases in which the charge distribution is quite symmetric. If the charge distribution is not symmetric, like if we have an infinitely long charge wire or an infinitely long plane, plane surface charge, I mean, the Gauss law is still valid, but we cannot really make practical use of it to calculate the electric field. In cases where we have this symmetry, we can uh, use it to evaluate the electric field explicitly rather than just considering the electric field as an integral over various parts of our system. And you might have probably noticed that, for example, we had discussed the electric field of a dipole. We placed a minus Q charge here, a plus Q charge over here, and we calculated the electric field along this line somewhere over here, and along this line, somewhere over there. But we didn't mention about the electric field, let's say, somewhere over here. I mean, when you want to really apply this in problems that you will see in nature, I mean, electric field lines will not have such nice alignments with what you are studying. 
So you need to know the electric field at an arbitrary point to be able to study such systems. We didn't ask this question yet because you calculating the electric field at that point using the vectors is just uh, too long. Now for that thing, we will wait until we discuss this potential and the potential energy. <coughs> and we will see that using potential and potential energy, it's a lot easier to study systems. Because the nice thing about the potential and potential energy would be that they are not vectors. So we don't need to bother about their direction. We don't need to worry about direction. So we just sum numbers to obtain the electric field. Now let's first define the potential energy. Now we have been talking about the force. If you have some charge over here, let's say a Q1 charge, another charge over here, let's say a charge Q2, they are separated by a distance, let's say D, then they will both feel a force. The Q1 charge will feel a force due to the Q2 charge, and that force will be 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, Q1, Q2, divided by D squared, in the direction R12, in some direction. If the charges are the same, it will ju be just a repulsive force. If the charges are different, it will be an attractive force. <coughs> so this we know. If you remember from mechanics courses, we had uh, separated forces into two classes. We had these conservative forces and non-conservative forces. Now for the conservative force, If a force is conservative, you see this if f dot dl as you go from point one to point two is independent of path. This is what we mean basically by a conservative force. If you calculate the work done as the object moves from point one to point two, under the influence of a conservative force, it doesn't matter how you go from point one to, it shouldn't matter how you go from point one to point two. If it does depend on how you go from point one to point two, for example, the friction force, in that case, the force is called a non-conservative force. Now, so the question is, is the electric force a conservative force or not? Why? How do you know? So, so the charges are conserved. The number of charges does not change, but that doesn't necessarily mean the force. I mean, if you consider the friction force, friction force doesn't change the amount of mass. But it's nevertheless a conserv not, not a conservative force. So how do we know that the electric field is a conservative force? How do you know? I mean, just because the book says that it's a conservative force doesn't mean it's a conservative force. Let's prove it. Let's prove that the electric force is a conservative force. Now, it will just follow the, the, the proof that we did in when we were studying the gravitational force. Now, let's start with a single charge. So we have this charge fixed over there. It's not moving. We just fix it. We just nail it at that point. And we take our test charge, let's say, call it small q, and we let it move from that point to this point along two different paths. Let's take, let me take some simple paths. This one, path one, and this one, path two. So is the work done along these two paths the same? Now, what do we do to calculate the work? is we just divide the path into very, very small segments and calculate f dot dl for each one of these segments and sum them up. So that's how we calculate the work. How do we divide the path in very, very small segments? It's arbitrary. You can just choose, choose to di divide them into equal segments of equal length. Now, in this case, I will not choose to dif divide them in equal length, but I will make consider this procedure. I will imagine concentric circles. This is one circle around the charge Q. This is another circle. Yeah. 
Now, these are all circles <coughs> with center R. Now, they, let's say that a given one, I will just call the, its radius R. This is a perpendicular vector. This is perpendicular. And the separation between the two will be dr. Now, let us compare the work done as we go along this line. This is dl1. And along the other line, this is dl2. So I have these two small segments. They just correspond to each other. And I will calculate the work done omega one, omega 1 is equal to f1 dot dl1. And omega 2 is equal to f2 dot dl2. So I would like to compare these two work. Now let's start with omega 1. This is equal to f1. Well, f1 I can just write as 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, small q, large q, divided by r squared. It's in the r hat direction, that dl1. So let's, let's remember the definition of the scalar product. This is our vector a. This is our vector b. A dot b was equal to, this is the angle theta. This is the length of a, length of b, times cosine of the angle between the two. This is equal to a times cosine theta. This is also equal to a times cosine beta times b. Now, a times cosine theta is just this length. So the scalar product of two vectors, I can just write it down as the length of one of the vectors times the component of the other vector, the length of the component of the other vector in the direction of the first vector. So this a dot b is the length of the vector b times the length of the component of a in the direction of b. That is, the, that is the definition of scalar product. Now let's look at this one. This is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, q large q over r squared, the length of r hat 1, that's a unit vector, and we say the component of the length of the component of dl1 in the direction of the r hat vector. Or let me write it like this. This was the notation that we had used. <coughs> but the component of dl1, the length of the component of dl1 in the radial direction, is nothing but the separation between these two rings, which is nothing but dr. This is omega 1. Now let's look at omega 2. This is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, q, q over r squared. Well, it's the same r squared because we are at the same distance. Now let me call this r1. And here are two hat. Because you see, r1 here is in this direction. This is my r1. And at this point, r is in this direction. This is r2 hat. It is a vector that points away from the origin, that's q, the point of the charge q. So at the top point, it is a vector like this. And the, at the second point, it's a vector like this. dot dl2. Again, this is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, 
q times q over r squared dl2, the length of dl2 in the radial direction, but the length of dl2 in the radial direction is again dr. And the work done along the, the segment of the first path is equal to the work done along the segment of the second path. So if you look at these paths over there, except on this one, we have to do a bit more work over there. Along these paths, the work done as you go along the first path or the second one is the same. They're equal. Well, there's just a single part that you have to you have to pay attention to. Now, all of these segments, for each segment of the first path, there is a corresponding segment in the second path for each one of them, but not here. Let me add another circle over there. Now we have a very small segment over here of the second path which doesn't have an analog in the first path. But we don't really care about that because this segment and this segment, they are similar. So the work done as we go from this point to this point is the same as the work done as we go from this point to that point, the next point. But since we are moving in opposite directions, one is negative, the other one is positive. So if we sum these two work, we, we get zero. So basically, the work done as we go from here to that point along the second path is equal to the work done as we go from this point over here up to the last point. As we go from there to here, we don't do any work. The network is zero. So this is basically the proof that the work done at this, if we have a single test charge, in the presence of a single other charge, the work done as that our test charge, uh, on our test charge as it go from one point to the other point is independent of how you go from the first point to the second point. This is, this, this is a proof only for in the presence of a single point charge. <coughs> now we can generalize this. If we have any charge distribution, not just necessarily a point charge. Now here, this is the proof that electric force created by a point charge is conservative. But if you have more than one charges, you have many charges over here. And then we imagine our test charge it goes from this point to this point, either like that or from the other path. <coughs> now, the work done on our test charge will be the integral of the total force times dl. But this will be the total force is nothing but the force created by each one of these point charges as we go from the initial path to the other path or we can write it as the work done by each one of these individual forces, and then we sum over all the forces. But since this is independent of path, each one of these terms in the sum is independent of path because the Fi is nothing but the force due to a point charge. And we had just proven that the force due to a point charge the work done by that force is independent of how you go from the first point to the second point. Each term is independent of path, so the sum is independent of path. So whatever the charge distribution you have, the electric field created by that charge distribution, the work done by that, uh, the force due to that electric field will be conservative. Questions? This is exactly the same proof that we, that we did in when we were proving that the gravity is a conservative force. 
Now, if we have a conservative force, we know that we could define a potential energy. And the potential energy, let's say, the, some initial point, you start your charge from an initial point, minus from P0 to P, F dot DL. This is the potential energy defined for the system. Now, P0 is just some arbitrary point. You can choose any point you like. The value of the potential energy at that point, it's also arbitrary. So it's our reference point. Now, the important thing is that we can only measure the potential differences. That is the work done as the object goes from one point to the other point. So that U of P0 and the P0 is completely arbitrary. It's up to you. Now, why do we have the minus sign? That is quite often. Uh, causes confusion. You can look at this equation in this form. From P0 to P minus F dot DL. Now, what difference does it make? So you have your system. Now, just you can consider the gravitational potential energy. You have your object. I'm holding it. As I'm lifting it up, well, there is the gravitational force pointing it downward. If I lift it up very slowly so that its kinetic energy doesn't change, the amount of force I have to exert on this one is minus F. So I am exerting a force minus F to move this object from the point P0 to the final destination P. And I am doing work in this time. While I am doing work, you can think of it as I am storing energy in my system. So initially it had some energy, U of P0. Then I did some work on this system, and the work that I did is nothing but minus F dot DL. That is the additional amount of energy I stored in my system. So now the total energy stored in my system is their sum. So that's why we have the minus F. F is the force exerted by the field, but if you want to move your the object from P0 to P very slowly, you have to exert this force minus F. This is the work that you have to do to carry the object from P0 and to P. So that's why we have this minus. <coughs> well, we, ha we already have this uh, kinetic energy theorem. The change in the potential energy is minus the change. The work done by you, by any force on the object, is changing the kinetic energy. So if the kinetic energy is changing, some of the work that you have done is not stored in the potential energy, but it is stored in the kinetic energy. So this equality wouldn't hold if you are giving the object kinetic energy. Well, let's start with the point charge. What is the potential energy if we have two point charges? Again, we have the, let's say, fixed point charge, large Q over there, a small charge Q over there. So what is the potential energy of the system when they are separated by, let's say, a distance R? First of all, we have to choose some reference point P0. Now, let me choose a point P0 somewhere over here just for simplicity. Or, I mean, no, we don't even have to choose it over there. Where, we should, where shall we choose the, our reference point, P0? Hmm? I mean, you would like to avoid the points where you have the charges, because at those points, you have an infinite electric field and an, hence an infinite force. So you can choose any, po any point that is not at the small Q or that's not at large Q. What, which point would you like to choose? Now, let us choose it over there. This is my reference point. Right over there. And my charge is over here. So what do I do now? <coughs> OK, first. <coughs> We know that the work done as we move our test charge from this point 
So the point on the screen is independent of the work, ind independent of the path. So I can just choose a, sim a path which will make my calculation simple. Now what path will I choose? I will start from that point. I will go around the circle whose center is my charge Q. Why? Because as long as I'm on moving on this circle, the electric, the force is perpendicular to the circle, so there is no, the force and the displacement, they are perpendicular to each other, there is no work done. So I will start from here, move around the circle, I will come, over, I will come somewhere over there, until I reach a point on the extension of the screen, somewhere over here. Well, just for simplicity, let us imagine, let me take this point P prime the corresponding point. What is P prime? I have the P zero point over there. I just moved around a circle until I, I reached a uh, point on this plane. And that point that I reached is P zero prime. Yes, yes, Q is at the center of this circle. I just started from there, went around the circle, taking large the point of large Q as my center. And eventually, I reached the point on the screen somewhere over there. That point is P0 prime. Now, I need to calculate this, this uh, U of P will be U of P0 minus from P0 up to my point P. This is my point P of F dot DL. This is what I need to calculate. This is equal to u of p0 minus, okay, I came from p0 up to p0 prime, f dot dl minus, and then I continued from p0 prime up to the point p, f dot dl. But we just said that I'll, as I go from p0 to p0 prime, I'm moving on a circle with charge q at the center. So this term is, is just zero. There is no work done as I go from point P0 to P0 prime. Now I'm taking this small q. I take my q, my small q, I start from here. I move it around over the circle first. And then small q arrived P0 prime and from P0 prime, the small q will eventually arrive at the point P. I am calculating the work that I am doing as I move small q from the point P0 up to P prime. And then I need to calculate this one. I need to move from P0 prime up to P. This is the last segment of my path. And again, I divide that path into very small segments. This is one segment. This dl vector is in the radial direction minus dl in the radial direction. Or let, let's write it uh, dl in the radial direction. Just note, dl, it will be important in a moment, dl is less than zero. At least in this sketch, dl is less than zero. Because I started from a distance that is far away, I'm moving towards the origin, I'm moving in the opposite direction of our hat. f, it is nothing but one over four pi epsilon zero, small q, large q, divided by L squared in the R hat direction. L is this length. I am at a distance L from the large charge q. And I'm moving towards the point P. I, I took my charge, small charge P, I'm moving it towards the point P.
So this is my system. I know F, I know DL. I need to calculate F dot DL. F dot DL, well, I have the two vectors. This is nothing but 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, Q large Q over L squared times DL. Both vectors are in the same direction. Well, they are in opposite direction, so cosine of the angle between the two is co 180, but remember, DL that I have over there is a negative number. So I don't have any additional minus signs. U at the point P is equal to U at the point P0 minus 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 Q, Q over L squared DL. L starts from the distance of the point P0 from the charge Q. Well, remember, although it starts off from the distance of P0 prime from this charge Q, but the distance of P0 prime from the charge Q is the same as the distance of the charge P0 from the charge Q because I moved over a circle. So I started from, let's say, R0. Th this is the distance of the charge Q, P0 from the charge Q. Distance of P0 from Q. And eventually, I reach the point R. U of P would be equal to U of P0 plus 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 Q, Q over L squared integrated from L is equal to R0 up to R. So U of P U of P0 plus, well, let me write it in the other page. One over four pi epsilon zero, one over R minus U of P0. This is small Q, large Q. Epsilon 0, 1 over R0. So this is the potential of the point P. Now from, oh sorry, this is L, not L squared. Now the next question, what to do with this? Well, you can just leave it as it is, if you like. Or you can choose some particular value of U of P zero. You can, for example, choose it's up but the value of u of p0 is completely arbitrary you can just choose it whichever value you like but you have to keep with this that convention and um, you cannot change the value of u of p0 uh, you, you you can you cannot take it one value in one part of the problem and another value in the other part of problem you have you have to pick one value and stick with that value all the time so you can choose Four pi epsilon zero q q over r zero. This is a choice. You can make other choices, and in some cases you will need to make other choices, which gives you the potential energy of the system one over four pi epsilon zero q q over r. Now, this choice of the U of P0, 
amounts to choosing the potential to be zero when the two particles are infinitely far away. Well, that is not necessary. That's not a necessary choice, but it's kind of a logical choice. If you have two charges at infinitely far away distances, they are not exerting any force on each other. There is no work you can. There is no energy you can extract from the system, and because they will not be pulling or pushing each other, you don't need to do any work on the system as you are moving these charges. So there is no change in the work as long as they are at infinite separations. So, uh, and they are not even aware of the presence of the other one. So the best choice will be the electric energy of the system, if they are infinitely far away, should be to take it to be zero. Again, I, I repeat, you don't have to take it to be zero. It's just a choice. Any questions up to here? Yes. I'm just telling, I mean, this choice is the same as saying that the potential energy at infinite separation should be zero. Is this the poten what is the potential energy of? And we are saying, okay, there is a potential energy. Is it the potential energy of the point charge small q? Does this potential energy belong to the discharge or What's the potential energy of? Yeah, potential energy is always something between the objects. It's, it's a property of the whole system, not just one of the point charges. So if this charge is not there, you don't have any potential energy. So it is something related with the whole system, not just part of the system. Well, of course, when we are, for example, talking about the gravitational potential energy, we talk about the gravitational potential energy of this mass, which is not exactly true, but most of the time it is valid because the Earth will not move. It is as if it is fixed. But in a more correct thing to say would be it is the gravitational potential energy of this mass and Earth. Okay, if it is a property of the combined system, why didn't I talk about the potential energy or the work that needs to be done to bring this large charge Q over there? I mean, we have all, all only calculated the, w the work that we have to do to bring this small charge Q from infinity up to this point. That is what we call the potential energy. But why didn't we bring this large Q to start with? How, how did it reach over there? Okay, we once it came over here, we just fixed it. I mean, I could have as well said, okay, this is fixed over there, this is fixed over there. So in that case, would you say that there is no potential energy? Equal to what? Well, of course, if we fix this one and move this one from infinity to this point, we will get the same potential energy, which is basically another statement that the potential energy is not a potential energy of this or the potential energy of this. It's a potential energy of the, com the whole system. But I in that case, I mean, it's kind of the potential energy is the energy that y the work that you have to do in order to bring your system into its final form when they start from infinity. So you start f with this small q at infinity, this large q at some other infinity, but we all, and the total amount of work that you have to do to bring both of these charges into this configuration is the potential energy stored in the system. But we never talked about how we brought the first charge. And we calculated the work that we had to do if we want to bring the second charge into its position. We never talked about the work that we had to do to bring this one into its position. What is the work that we have to do to bring, let's say, the first charge into this place? No? You see, the first charge, my small q is not over there. I'm taking the, both of the charges are at infinity. They have zero potential en energy. I bring this large Q from infinity. How much work should I do? Zero. Hmm? Yes, but you see, <coughs> I'm not saying, okay, I put this 
small q over here, then I bring this large q from infinity to this point. That's not the question I'm asking. I have nothing. I bring first the large q or the small q, whichever one you like. I take that one from infinity and bring it to this position. No. How much work should I do? It's zero because there is no force. There is nothing that exerts force. I don't have to exert any force. So I do zero work to bring the first charge there. And then I bring the other charge from infinity to this point, and then I do this much work. In that case, I need to do this mu totally this much work. If I do the other way around, I can first bring the small charge and then the large Q charge over here. The total work I do will again be the same. It's the potential energy of the final configuration. Well, you see, the proof that we had, the path is independent. It doesn't matter how we bring these two charges together. It only depends on the final configuration and the initial configuration. And we are calculating the work done in between. Other questions? Does it matter? I mean, in this, in, while I was solving the problem, I just assumed that, okay, since it doesn't matter how I arrive at the final configuration, starting from the initial configuration, I first took the large charge Q from infinity, brought it over here. Then I fixed it. And then that being fixed, I, move, I took this small Q from the dot on your, from the point on your, or infinity, let's say, I took that small q from infinity and broke, brought it at this point. And I calculated the total work that I had to do. That is the amount of energy stored in the system. And it turned out to be this 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, the product of the charges divided by r. You, which force did you exert? Okay, so then you are doing work on the small charge Q. You are doing work. The, uh, since the other one is fixed, you are not doing any work on that one. Yes. We are not increasing the kinetic energy. If you increase the kinetic energy, the work that you do, some of it will be stored in the potential energy, some will be stored in the kinetic energy. You don't have to choose it that way. According to this shape, yes. R0 is larger than R. Well, you see, the limits of the integrals are not necessarily from small to large. The limits of the integrals is the lower limit uh, specifies the point that you started from I started from there, and the upper limit is the point at which you end your motion. So I ended over here. So those are how I determine the limits, not by which one is smaller, which one is larger. The thing that you have to pay attention to, the to though, is this fact. I mean, since P0 is larger than P, dl is smaller than 0. If R0 is smaller than larger than, no, if R0 is smaller than R, in that case, DL would be large. So that is one point that you have to pay attention to. The change in the kinetic energy will be equal to the change in the potential energy, that's true. Because the change in the potential energy is the work done not by you, by the way. The change in the potential energy is minus the work done by the force that is creating the potential energy. If you are uh, creating work, if you are increasing kinetic energy, that means the force that you are exerting 
is not equal to minus the force that is creating this potential. There's ne a net force, there's an acceleration. So the work that you do will not be equal to the change in the potential energy if there is a kinetic energy change. The work that you do will be equal to the change in the potential energy plus the change in the kinetic energy. Only if there is no change in the kinetic energy, the work that you have done is equal to the change in the potential energy. Okay, it will be the same work because that's the property of the conservative forces. The work that you do to uh, come to your final state, starting from the initial state, is independent of how you reach your final configuration. <coughs> <coughs> Whatever your, no matter how you go from your initial configuration to the final configuration, the charge that you can, you, the work that you have, to the will, the work that is done by the force creating this potential will be the same. Well, it might be zero, depending on which points, what is your initial and what are your final configurations. It might be zero, it might not be zero. In this case, it's not zero because we said we start from infinity and we come to some finite separation. In this case, it is not zero. It is still independent of how I started from charges at infinity and came to this configuration, though. Well, your, your friend is asking if the charge, we had opposite charges, will the work done by what? Will the work done by what? <coughs> the work done on Q by what? By you or by this force? by this force, will it be negative? You see, F dot DL, <coughs> I'm moving charges like this, let's say. And let's fix this one. This one is at, at somewhere over here. I'm moving it in this direction. What is the, if the charges are, ha are opposite sign, what is the direction of the force? Attractive or repulsive? It's attractive. DL is also in this direction. The force and the displacement are in the same direction, so the work done by this force is positive. The work that I would have to do if I want to move this charge from this point with a zero change in the kinetic energy to this point, the work that I need to do will be negative because I should be exerting a force in the opposite direction. Okay, let's give a break, and if you have questions, we can continue after the break. <laughs>